Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. If you're dating right now, you know it's a whole new world. You might be trying to figure out which of your app matches is worth a virtual date, what the most flattering lighting is for a Zoom call, what small talk you can make when you haven't left your apartment for a month. It might even be enough to make you nostalgic for what dating used to be. But this week's essay is a reminder that even when you could date in person, finding the right person to be with has always been a challenge. Sarah Eckel writes about that in her essay, Sometimes It's Not You or the Math. Sarah's essay is read by Laura Prepon. Laura is best known for her work in That 70s Show and Orange is the New Black. Now she's out with a new book. It's called You and I as Mothers. On my first date with Mark, he asked how long it had been since my last relationship. I looked at the table, cupping my hand around my beer. I had always hated this question. It seemed so brazenly evaluative. An employment counselor inquiring about a gap in your resume. A dental hygienist asking how often you flossed. I knew he wasn't appraising me. We had worked together for two months. And in this crowded bar, we spoke with the easiness and candor of good friends. He told me about the pain of his divorce, the financial strain, the loneliness. He had been hanging around my office, sending flirty emails and, most adorable to me and mortifying to him, blushing whenever I spoke to him. He was kind of in the bag. But I still didn't answer. I didn't want him to know the truth, that I was 39 and hadn't had a serious boyfriend in eight years. I had seen men balk at this information before, even when the numbers were lower. They would look at me in a cool and curious way as if I were a restaurant with too few customers, a house that had been listed for too long. One man actually said it. What's wrong with you? I don't know, I had answered. But you're attractive? He said, as if he wasn't sure anymore. I don't know what to tell you, I said. I don't know why. Now faced with Mark's innocent question, I hedged. A long time, I said quickly. Mark didn't seem to notice the evasion. He sipped his beer and we moved on to other topics. Our co-workers, Douglas Copeland novels, Seattle. And then, on a street corner outside the bar, to our first kiss. I knew I would eventually have to tell him but not yet. When my long-ago date asked that question, what's wrong with you? I was, of course, outraged. I finished my drink, said I had to get up early, but honestly, his question was no worse than the one I'd asked myself nearly every day. It wasn't full-blown self-loathing, more a hollowness that hit me in the chest at certain times. A long subway ride home from a mediocre date, A phone conversation with a married friend who suddenly said she had to go. Her husband just took the roast out of the oven. My solace came from a place where single women usually find it. My other single friends. We would gather on weekend nights, swapping funny and tragic stories of our dismal dating lives, reassuring one another of our collective beauty, intelligence, and kindness, marveling at the idiocy of men who failed to see this in our friends. Mostly, we would try to make sense of it all. Were our married friends really so much more desirable than we were? Once in a while, someone would declare that married women were actually miserable, that it was they who envied us. But this theory never got too far. We knew our married friends wouldn't switch places with us, no matter how much they complained about their husbands. Of course, there were many popular books and television shows that detail the lives of such women. But in those stories, adorable men constantly approach the heroines in parks and bus stops and ask them to dinner. The sitcom single woman is never alone for long. 
She skips from one man to the next, changing boyfriends as frequently as she changes purses. My friends and I had various dates and many relationships, but mostly we were alone. While many of us watched and enjoyed these shows, and didn't entirely mind when people remarked that our lives were just like the protagonist, the stereotype they created of the over-30 man-hunting singleton cast a shadow over us. Being an unattached woman who would rather not be somehow meant that you were a nitwit, a bubblehead who had few concerns beyond shopping pedicures and will he call? My friends and I had no interest in shopping or pedicures, but that didn't stop us from feeling wildly embarrassed that we longed for love. Admitting that you wanted a husband, much less that you were distraught that you didn't have one, seemed like a betrayal of feminism. We were supposed to be better than this. Not that any actual feminist said it was so awful to want a relationship. The emails we received from Now and Planned Parenthood focused on reproductive rights and equal pay, not dating and marriage. Professing a need for love could also be taken as evidence that you weren't ready for it. One December night, I was having drinks with a married male friend. He grew exasperated with my admittedly annoying complaints about having to spend yet another holiday season without a partner. Sarah, in almost every way, you have it together, he said. But on this one topic, you turn into this ridiculous girl. Like single women everywhere, I had bought into the idea that the problem must be me. That there was some essential flaw. Arrogance, low self-esteem, fear of commitment that needed to be fixed. I needed to be fixed. As a freelance writer, I couldn't afford a good therapist. But my job did give me access to some of the country's best mental health professionals. As I wrote articles on first dates and breakups, I interviewed psychology professors and therapists, shamelessly peppering the conversations with anecdotes from my own life. I was trying to get at the root of the problem, for the benefit of womankind, and for myself. I also talked to a lot of self-help authors. There was the tough love married lady who declared the key to finding a soulmate was to grow up, quit whining, and do something about your hair. There was the magical soulmate finder who prescribes keeping a journal, long hikes, candlelighted bubble baths, and other hocus pocus. And then there was the man, i.e. a moderately cute guy who wrote a book, who gave insider tips on how to hook up with him, which involves not being critical and having long hair. So I grew my hair out, I took bubble baths, and of course, I started examining my issues. Was my failure a result of my latent commitment phobia? cleverly masked as really wants and commitment, as one helmet-haired expert implied. Did I feel inherently unworthy and broadcast that low self-assessment to every man I met? Another gentle suggestion. Did my failure to love myself mean I was unable to love another? Or was I not positive enough? The experts agreed that a positive attitude was very important to attracting men. I could see it, sure, But this is not my strength. I believe global warming is real and heaven is a fantasy. I believe people who think everything happens for a reason must have never opened a newspaper. Some might call it negative. I call it realistic. A lot of good things happened during my period of constructing Sarah 2.0. I went to artist colonies, taught storytelling to young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, adopted a rescue dog, learned to do a handstand, all under the banner of learning to love my single life. And I made sure that everybody knew my life was super duper awesome with or without a man. My adorable apartment, my fulfilling career, my amazing friends. But I also knew I couldn't play that card too often, lest the Greek chorus conclude that my well-oiled life left no room for love. As a male friend once told me, Sometimes you see a woman who has her act together so well that you think, what does she need me for? My efforts yielded many friends and filled my calendar with fulfilling activities. I went on internet dates, speed dates, and blind dates. I had great hair and a confident smile, but I was still alone. In the dark of Saturday night, I still asked myself, what's wrong with me? Mark and I dated for a month before I revealed my shoddy relationship resume, and when I did, he shrugged. Lucky for me, he said. 
All those other guys were idiots. And that was it. To Mark, I was not a problem to solve, a puzzle that needed working out. I was the girl he was falling in love with, just as I was falling in love with him. Six years later this past June, he and I celebrated our first wedding anniversary. My close friends, the ones with whom I'd shared my impromptu therapy sessions, had come to the wedding in a small Brooklyn park. And so had their husbands. Did we find love because we grew up, got real, and worked through our issues? No. We just found the right guys. We found men who love us even though we're still cranky and neurotic, haven't got our careers together, and sometimes talk too loudly, drink too much, and swear at the television news. We have gray hairs and unfashionable clothes and bad attitudes. They love us anyway. What's wrong with me? Plenty. But that was never the point. That's Laura Prepon reading Sarah Eccles' essay, Sometimes It's Not You or the Math. We'll catch up with Sarah after the break. Sarah Eccles' essay was published in 2011. The response to it was huge. You know, that morning, that first morning that it was published, I just woke up to a huge email inbox of people from all over the world. I think I remember the first email that I opened, which was from a young gay man in Brazil who said, you're describing exactly the feeling that I've had and the question that I've asked myself, which is, what's wrong with me? It was quite overwhelming and and really fascinating to me that so many people around the world, this question that I had felt was so personal to me, what's wrong with me? Why can't I make this happen? That that question was so widespread. So many people were struggling with the same response. Sarah and Mark have been married for nearly 10 years now. They live in upstate New York with their cat. They've bought a house, and Sarah says Mark reminds her to step away from all the things she should be doing every once in a while. It's become a thing where where Saturday we always just do something that where we accomplish absolutely nothing that's really just for the fun of it. So um, that might mean driving to Albany and seeing a movie and going to Dinosaur Barbecue or going hiking. And he's really taught me that because every day I would always make sure I was accomplishing something. And now there's a, one day a week that nothing really gets accomplished. And Sarah says she hopes listeners hear one central message of her piece. The world is telling you that you're not okay, but... I'm here to tell you that you are okay. The world is wrong. And deep down, you already know this. You just need a reminder. It's not that you have to be perfect. It's just um, realizing that despite whatever your insecurities or anxieties are, you are fundamentally lovable and you deserve to be loved. We first spoke to Sarah Eckel in February. Since then... The world has changed so much that we wanted to check in again. So Sarah sent us a short audio postcard that she recorded at home. I'm just so aware of how much more difficult this is for so many other people. So I I, I think it's it's just given me a renewed appreciation for Mark and, and for the fact that we had already had a very gentle relationship and um, a commitment to really being kind to each other. And of course, that's, that's made a difference throughout all of this. We asked Sarah, as someone who's thought a lot about the single life, does she have any advice for single people right now? I think it's really important that both single people and people who are not single respect this experience that single people are having No one has really experienced anything like this before. And if you are somebody who is sheltering in place with a spouse or family or friends and people that you love and basically get along with, 
I think it's really important to recognize that what you are experiencing is profoundly different than the person who has to stay, especially to stay in a New York City apartment by themselves for a month and and who knows how long. And Sarah adds that it's okay to be lonely, especially right now. Loneliness is not a pathology. It is a normal human reaction like hunger or thirst. It isn't an indication that there's anything wrong with you. So that was the other thing I learned to do is to say, okay, right now I feel lonely. That's okay because that's a normal feeling that everyone feels sometimes. And so now I'm just going to investigate what is this feeling of loneliness. It really kind of seems like crap advice, like just sit in a corner and feel pain. Yay! It just sounds like the worst advice, but it's such a difficult situation. But perhaps there is an opportunity to strengthen your own kind of emotional resilience. Sarah Eckel. She's a freelance writer, and her book is It's Not You, 27 Wrong Reasons You're Single. More after the break. Here's Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for The New York Times. Every once in a while, but pretty rarely, a writer tackles something so commonplace but makes it so new and fresh that you kind of gasp. (laughs) And that was the case with Sarah's essay, which, you know, explores this incredibly common phenomenon of, of not finding love and assuming that it's because you have some sort of profound character flaw that is keeping that from happening. And coming around to eventually find someone that you're a good match with and realizing that you just hadn't found the right person yet. There's really nothing new about that story arc, but the way that she presents it and the way that she, in the end, comes to the conclusion that Of course, there's plenty wrong with me, but that was never the point. There's someone for everyone, and there's the cliché aspect of that, and there's the true aspect of that. And here's Laura Prepon. I remember the days of being single and looking for my partner and asking myself, what is wrong with me? Where is he? And just searching. And then finally... I found him. I do believe in happy endings. And that's why I chose this essay. And a special thanks to Laura for recording herself in her home office with a new baby at home. She's author of a new book called You and I as Mothers. Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Caitlin O'Keefe. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed. Iris Adler is our executive producer. We're edited by Catherine Brewer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for The New York Times and advisor to the show. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Additional thanks to Mia Lee, Julia Simon, and Anya Stremian at the New York Times, and to Paul Kahlo at WBUR. Additional music, courtesy of APM. I'm Magna Chakrabarty. We'll see you next week.